I'm so excited because we're here on the other side of the screen is our friend, Max Licato. Max, welcome to the Proverbs for You Ministries podcast. You are very kind. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Of course. Well, we know, Max, you are no stranger to the podcast because you've been on several times before. And to Proverbs, you're really like an extension of family around here. And he so, really is. Really. Yes. Like the uncle of Proverbs 31. Oh, yes. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> title, Max. You might want to add that to your resume. Yeah. Just call me uncle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so today, Max, you're here to give us a message from your new book, Help Us Here. And what you're going to talk to us today about is how the Holy Spirit is the forgotten gift of God. And when I heard what you were going to talk about, I got really excited because Kendra and I know this isn't a subject that's really covered right. enough, I think, in the Christian world. And so we're excited to hear what you have to share with us and you can take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, most of my work on the book, Help Us Here, took place during the pandemic. I remember when I began uh, working on the book, those phrases like shelter in place and social distancing and flatten the curve, they were unheard of. Now they're common lingo. Now, I'm, I'm really grateful that the worst of the pandemic has passed. And as we make a list of what we've learned in it, I want to add one observation that needs to be included in the history books. We learned that we do not know how to pray. Mm -hmm. I know this to be true because we created a virtual prayer page. And each day I posted an online message of hope and an open invitation. Just post your prayers and we will pray for you or post your prayer needs and we'll pray with you. Well, the page was flooded with requests from Connecticut to Cambodia. They came hundreds of thousands of statements like pray that I get some work, pray that I get along with my family, ask God to help me sleep, pray that I can get a job. But the most common request was the most heartfelt, heartfelt one. And that is people just didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. They would say things like I'm at a loss for words or can you just mention my name? I want to pray, but I can't. Or most of the time when I pray, I just cry. Or I pray, but the words don't seem to match the need. Or all I can do is sigh. And I realize that most of us just, we struggle sometimes to pray. We have groans. Uh, we have longings. And these are the vernacular of pain, the chosen tongue of despair. And sometimes there are no words. And sometimes the prayers just won't come forth. Now, some days we have nice poetic petitions, but stormy seasons generate mournful sounds of sadness and fear and dread. And yet one of the assignments, one of the uh, works of the Holy Spirit is to take these raw appeals and present them into the presence, before the presence of God the Father. Our prayers, our wordless sighs, are entrusted into the care of the Holy Spirit. It was the Apostle Paul who taught us this. He said, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Romans 8, 26 and 27. I believe few passages reveal the tender heart of the Holy Spirit as much as this one. We're accustomed to his mighty deeds. We've read about fire falling on Peter or doors opening for Paul or Ezekiel seeing the dead bones rise or Moses seeing the Red Sea open. Yet of equal import is this. The Spirit curates and translates the incoherent prayers of the weak until they are heard in the tribunal of heaven. Mm 
And we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, when we pray, we sometimes groan inwardly. That's that's the word of the Apostle Paul. In other words, we can have the presence of the Spirit, but that does not guarantee the absence of pain. Pain is a part of every life. And sometimes this pain leads to a feeling of weakness. Now, the word Paul uses here for weakness appears in other places in his epistles. And when he uses it elsewhere, it refers to physical affliction. He talks about his own weakness in Galatians 4.13, his own affliction. He talks about the illness of Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23. So infirmity was in the forefront of Paul's mind. And boy, sickness sure can sap our energy. I, I recall a time that I had a bout with atrial fibrillation. It left me battling a rapid heartbeat for months on end, and it literally drained my energy, drained my strength. The doctors were baffled. I was discouraged. And I would often slip into our sanctuary in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, and kneel at our prayer altar and offer these unadorned petitions. Now, maybe your weakness is different. Maybe cancer has robbed the vigor of your youth. Maybe multiple sclerosis has siphoned the breath of your life. Maybe rheumatoid arthritis has stiffened your joints. In these times, our prayers, well, they feel like groans. Or maybe your weakness emerges from a different source. You're weak from a crumbling marriage, from a business failure, from the rejection of a loved one. Maybe you're weak from unemployment. It is in times like this that the mind is just too troubled to articulate a prayer. Mm-hmm. For like Hezekiah, he confessed, I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary with looking upward. Isaiah 38 and verse 14. Or the psalmist said, I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie open before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. That's in Psalm 38. You see, there's often a gap between what we want from life and what we get in life. And during such times, during this weakness, we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Thank you, Apostle Paul, for this honest admission. If you, the Apostle, the author of epistles, did not always know how to formulate a prayer, then we take heart, for there are times we just don't know what to say. For what should the cancer patient request? Healing or heaven? For what should the father of the prodigal pray? Patience or another pig pen? For what should the persecuted prisoner ask, release from captivity or endurance in captivity? We don't know how to pray as we ought. And sometimes we wonder if our prayers are too sparse to even deserve an audience with God, or what if he turns us away? Other people seem to pray with such boldness and resolve and assurance. We read of prayers that open prison doors for Peter, or silenced Mediterranean storms for Paul, And yet we can barely utter an Our Father. Does heaven hear the enfeebled prayers of a weary soul? Thanks to our heavenly helper, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. The Spirit himself intercedes for us. Now, to intercede is simply to stand in between. When a person strong takes up the cause of another person who is weak, intercession happens. Intercession happened for my wife and me way back in 1983. My wife and I moved to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We were the greenest of gringos. We scarcely spoke Portuguese. We'd never lived outside of the country. And we had read books on cross-cultural adaptation, but no book can prepare you for that moment in which you step off an airplane without a return ticket. Our adjustment was really challenging because our possessions got stuck in customs. Wow. We had a crate full of furniture and pictures and dishes and books and pots and pans, but we couldn't get to them. We had an apartment that we rented, and yet the apartment was empty. The crate was full. (laughs) All we needed was for the customs official to release it Mm -hmm. to us. And for several weeks, I made regular trips to the customs office. 
And in my broken Portuguese, I would say, could my crate be released? And always the answer was the same. No, senor. And his explanation included words like delayed or needs approval or return tomorrow. I did not understand the problem. I did not understand the language enough to plead my case. So I was at an impasse. And so you can imagine the dread I felt every day when I went home and told my wife, I just can't get our stuff out of customs. Enter Kenyo, our next door neighbor. His name, Kenyo. <laughs> Literally, his wife entered our apartment. They introduced themselves to us. We didn't have a place for them to sit. So we stood as we sipped coffee. I told them why we had no furniture and Kenyo began to smile. He said, I'll help you. I'm a lawyer. I said, no, but I've been trying for a month. But he said, no, I can do this. And could he ever? <laughs> we walked into the customs office the next day and Kenyo approached the same official who had rebuffed me time and time again. Within moments, the two men were laughing. Kenyo pointed at me, motioned for me to step over. He put his arm around my shoulder. He said something to the official about being my neighbor, there may have been some exchange of money. I'm not sure. All I know is it worked. <laughs> the crate was released. Our furniture was delivered. And my wife was very, very happy. Oh. <laughs> now, the reason I tell you that story is to give you an example of intercession. You see, Kenyo had everything I did not. He understood the culture. He knew the language. He could interpret the law. He perceived the problem. He knew how to persuade the customs official, and he spoke on my behalf. He was our advocate. Mm -hmm. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. In those moments, when you feel you have nothing going for you, be assured you have an advocate. You have God's Spirit. Mm -hmm. As one writer said, even if people can do no more than sigh for redemption and then fall dumb as they sigh, God's Spirit already sighs within them and intercedes for them. Yeah, we don't know how to pray as we ought, mm -hmm. but the Spirit does. Mm -hmm. And does He ever. Unlike the customs official, your Father is more than willing to release blessings in abundance. You have the Spirit as your advocate and your Father as your provider. Mm -hmm. You may feel weak, but you've never been stronger. Mm -hmm. As a result, the greatest prayer warriors might very well appear to be the weakest ones, the convicted criminal in jail, mm -hmm. the immigrant at the border, the forgotten child in the orphanage. The prayer shawl of depression is every bit as holy as the one made of linen. Wow. I can remember visiting my mother when she was riddled with dementia mm -hmm. and she would lie in her bed and just mumble. I believe our good God heard her. When the PTSD veteran longs for the courage to reenter society, is this not a heaven worthy prayer? Please hear this right now at this moment, as I read these words and you hear them, as I share these words and you receive them, the spirit of the living God mm -hmm. is talking to the Trinity about you. The eternal, unending, ever creating spirit mm -hmm. is speaking on your behalf. Mm -hmm. He is making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. That's Romans 8, 26 in the message translation. The ESV translation says he intercedes for us with groanings too deep with words. The Good News Bible says he pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. Do you not find this amazing? Help is here. The greatest force, the only true force in the universe is your ally, your spokesperson, and your advocate. Paul goes on to say, he keeps us present before God. That is why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Mm -hmm. Romans 28. 
What you pray in the night is heard in the light of your Father's throne. The book of Psalms says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Psalm 56 and verse 8. Mm -hmm. So I close by just saying, let this assurance add value to your time of prayer. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul did. I, I think if he were asked, how is a person supposed to walk in the Spirit? He would simply say, pray. Mm -hmm. Just pray. Know that when you speak, heaven hears you. His life was devoted to prayer. He prayed regularly, continuously, and urged us to do the same. On all occasions, he urged us, pray in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit as our friend, as our guide, as our teacher. But we also have the Holy Spirit as our advocate who takes our prayers that are sometimes nothing more than groans and turns them into pieces of poetry worthy of being heard in heaven. Mm -hmm. And that's the privilege we have as we associate with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that was so good. Uh, well, I have a question for you, Max, but I first I have to say um, when you made a point kind of close to the end of your teaching and you said, uh, your mother, I think struggled with dementia and she mumbled in the bed. Mm -hmm. Um, and you knew that God heard even that, um, that ministered to my heart so much because my grandmother, um, has Alzheimer's and I've watched her become this woman who loves Jesus and taught Sunday school and all of that. And she's just not who she was anymore. Mm -hmm. And I have wondered, why? Like, mm -hmm. why after all of this time and being such a faithful person, is this what happens in the mm -hmm. end? And I know that I won't understand why, but I, it's almost felt like God has just kind of, I, I know that he hasn't been absent, but it just feels like he has whenever mm -hmm. you wonder why someone keeps getting worse after years of just yeah. living life to the fullest. And hearing you say that God still understands mm -hmm. because of the Holy Spirit. That just means, that just means the world yeah. to me to hear. And um, it, it means the world to me to hear that he still hears and understands her, but also those moments that I didn't know what to pray. And mm -hmm. all I could really say was why mm -hmm. or ask him, God, please take this away. And knowing that even if he didn't, that, that I would still love him and trust him. But that just, that just meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Cause I think that there might be other people out there who are walking through yeah. memory loss and wondering why too. And that, that was just such a moment of ministry. Um, Wow. Now I have to shift. <laughs> now I have to shift gears <laughs> and ask a question, but um I want to ask you a question as a pastor and a man who studies God's word. Um, we have a lot of different listeners represented here at Proverbs, mm -hmm. and some of them have grown up in the church, and some of them might be new to the faith mm -hmm. and don't really understand how the Holy Spirit is uniquely different from God the Father or God the Son. So uh, would you be willing to give us just a little... Um, Glimpse. overview, like a glimpse <laughs> and explain um, what we um, in Christianity refer to the Trinity so we can better understand how the Holy Spirit is unique. Yeah. Well, the Trinity is the word we use to describe the triune God, our triune God, uh, one God expressed in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And while they uh, the expression of our God through those three different manifestations or, or persons is uh, unique. There is also a lot of overlap. The big idea is that God is working to create a kingdom in which he will reign forever with those children who say yes to him. So God will have his Garden of Eden. That can be we, Of that we can be sure. And that this God who is calling this to be uh, comes to us in the form of a father who provides 
and protects, mm-hmm. a Savior mm-hmm. who teaches and is our sacrifice mm-hmm. and our uh, uh, who, who, who is the pathway over the victory of death, and then the Holy Spirit who exists to bring strength and energy, who continues the work that was begun by God the Father, Jesus the Son, and then God the Savior, and then the Spirit continues that work. I think it's safe to say that his assignment or his unique role is to sustain and empower the work that's already begun. He sustains and empowers that work. Uh, When Jesus died on the cross, everything necessary for my salvation was done. When I say yes to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and guarantees my salvation. He is the seal around my soul and the seal around yours. He does not add to what Jesus did on the cross, but he sustains it. He continues it. Mm -hmm. And so again, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, their assignments, their roles are overlapping in many places, but they have this unique assignment. So I think it's helpful to understand the role of the Holy Spirit by looking at the different metaphors in the New Testament. And that's what the book is about. It looks at the different word pictures. Uh, The Holy Spirit is wind or the Holy Spirit as the seal of the saint or the fire in the soul of the saint. All these different, there's well over a dozen of those in the Bible. I only looked at a dozen of them. (laughs) Uh, But the Holy Spirit helps us then continue this work that is already done. And then finally, he is the executor of God's will on earth today. He is the executor of God's will. Whatever is desired by the Trinity is carried out right now by the Holy Spirit. He is everywhere simultaneously. Uh, He is as much where you are as where I am. And I think most importantly is that he takes up residence in the heart or in the soul, in the being of the man or woman who says yes to, to, to God, to salvation through Jesus Christ. He does not indwell those who reject God, but even those who reject God are blessed by his protection and, and covering. He, we, they enjoy the universal grace, but we who are Christians enjoy the particular and personal grace of the indwelling presence of Christ. And what we discuss today is just one of the many things that he does to help us grow and be strong in our faith. That was so helpful. That was helpful. Yeah, because I think that, you know, we can, we think about God the Father or God the Son, like you said, like about providing um, or our Savior, but then so often when we do pray, we forget that we have somebody who's already with us that's helping us yeah. approach that throne of grace. So I, that was so helpful, Max. Yes. Kendra, I know you have a question. For I Max do. As well. I do. Okay. So Max, I want to talk about the spiritual discipline of prayer mm-hmm. because there's a lot of different spiritual disciplines we might see in the Bible, like fasting or mm-hmm. solitude. And so for somebody who might not um, have the spiritual discipline of prayer or might need a little more help with their prayer life, what is one piece of advice you'd have for somebody as they look into the spiritual discipline of prayer? Yeah, I sure wish I could talk to that person and ask them, what is it that keeps you from praying? Mm -hmm. Uh, Many people fear they might miss pray. They might pray inappropriately Mm -hmm. or incorrectly. And so our discussion today hopefully is really encouraging because we're reminded that even our groans, even our sighs, Uh, are heard in heaven, thanks to the Holy Spirit. I I do not believe we can mispray any more than a a five-year-old can, uh, you know, climb up on his father's lap too quickly. I mean, we're quick to forgive that five-year-old if he scampers up in our lap and gives us a hug, uh, if it's done out of a a pure heart. And so uh, don't let your intimidation of prayer keep you from praying. And Jesus taught us to pray. He said, when you pray, just say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so I would begin with the Lord's Prayer and just recite it. And as you're reciting it, let the words become yours and add your phrases to the phrases of the Holy Spirit uh, as taught by Jesus. For example, when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, you might pause right there and say, Lord, Today, I think about how holy you are, your hallowed name. 
You're unlike anything I've ever seen, any being I've ever been, yet you allow me to call you Father. And so you can take the, the Lord's Prayer uh, as taught to us by Jesus and revealed to us through the Spirit and just make it your outline for prayer. And that can help you maybe overcome this hesitation that you have in your prayer life. Thank you, Max. That was yeah. that was a good little tidbit of, of yeah. advice for those who might struggle with prayer. Yeah, yeah. And I think such a good question for us to end on. If you're listening to this and you're struggling in your prayer life or you feel distant from God, think about what it is that's keeping you from prayer, yeah. like Max said. That was yeah. so helpful. That was helpful, Max. Man, Max, <laughs> I wish that we could talk for three hours about this. I joked at the beginning before we pressed record that we would be talking for three hours today, and we're not. But I wish that we had that time. <laughs> but we appreciate any time that you can spend with us, Max. You're such a great well, teacher. Well, it sure went it sure went fast. It did. It was a delight to talk to you, and I, I hope we have a chance to do it again sometime.